Welcome to another class on the book of Daniel. This is the seventh in our series on this particular book. This lesson was presented on Thursday evening, 25th February 2021, originally in a Zoom class for the British Bible School, as the UK continues in lockdown, but more solid plans for us to be coming out of lockdown within the next couple of months. This particular lesson, we're going to be in Daniel chapter 5. We're going to be looking at the writing on the wall. The painting here, by the way, is the painting of Belshazzar's Feast by Rembrandt. Wikimedia Commons tells me it's in the public domain, so I guess he lived long enough ago that we can use his. Keep in mind that in Daniel chapter 5, we are still in an Aramaic section of the text rather than a Hebrew section. Uh, that doesn't change back until uh, in the vision section as we saw earlier. This is the outline that we're using for this particular um, study of Daniel. And we're trying to do this, as you can see, in a chronological order, at least as best as I can determine a chronological order. This particular lesson we are on chapter 5, the writing on the wall. That particular um, chapter breaks down really into two easy sections, and that's how we're going to look at it. We've got the first 16 verses being Belshazzar's drunken feast, with the last section being Daniel interpreting the writing on the wall, and of course what happened. And these, of course, can be subdivided into uh, the toasting of false gods with the temple vessels. We've got Belshazzar terrified. We've got the queen remembering Daniel. And we've got Daniel offering rewards for interpreting. Then the last section, Daniel tell, explains the reason it was happening. We see the interpretation. And then finally, we will see what happened that night. In our timeline, uh, chapter 5 would take place, and we're pretty confident here, in about 539 B.C. So you see it definitely takes place after chapter 7 and 8. Chapter 7 and 8, if you remember, in those visions took place early in Belshazzar's uh, reign. Uh, chapter 5 is going to be the last year of that. Uh, Belshazzar is not one of the kings that's listed amongst the extra-biblical accounts of the Babylonian kings of this era. Uh, just to summarize at least the kings that really would affect the study of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar, um, who is the, the first king really of Babylon as a world empire. 605 is when they defeated uh, Babylon defeated Assyria. And then Nebuchadnezzar ruled from 605 to 562. He was followed by Amal Marduk, and uh, he's known in Jeremiah 52 as Evo Merodach. Uh, he's a son of Nebuchadnezzar. He rules for two years. He was followed by Nurgal Sharazar, who ruled for about four or five years, uh, also known as Mergul Sharazar. He was the brother-in-law of evil Merodach, and um, Nurgle uh, assassinated, murdered evil Merodach. He was followed by Lab Labasi Merodach. Uh, see, he only ruled for a matter of months, a very weak ruler, uh, was overthrown by Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and some other conspirators. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, Nebunaid, is also how his name is rendered in the historical writings uh, outside the Bible. In fact, he's not even mentioned in the Bible. But many historians believe he was married to a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. 539 being the date that Babylon as a world empire is overthrown. In fact, when you look at that from 605 to 539, it wasn't the world empire for all that long, was it? But you notice we're missing one particular king, are we not? 
and that's Belshazzar. For many years, it was thought by many scholars that Belshazzar never existed. He was fiction because there were no historical references to him in the annals of Babylon. If you read a commentary before 1900, a good chance they will take this particular position. John Lennox wrote, It was formerly assumed that Daniel 5 had little or no historical substance, for the simple reason that there was no independent verification of the existence of a monarch called Belshazzar. All of this changed, however, with the finding of the so-called Nebuchadnezzar cylinders, which are now in the British Museum. Uh, we now know a lot more about Belshazzar, thanks to the archaeological discoveries. Uh, you can go to the British Museum today, and usually they have, they have at least one of these cylinders on display. I have photographs of them, but sadly, British, the British Museum uh, retains copyright even on things that you um, photograph in the museum, so I cannot show that in this presentation on YouTube. But nevertheless, you can go there and see it if you wish. But on one of them, and John Lennox references this, on one of them, uh, this is the, the statement that, that's, that's made on it. I understook the construction of that ziggurat on the foundations which Ur Namu and his son Shulgi built following the original plan with bitumen and baked brick. I rebuilt it for Sin, the Lord of the gods of heaven and the underworld, the God of gods who lives in the great heavens, the Lord of Egesh Nugal in Ur, my Lord. Then he goes on to say, Let their tem the, 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 the temples, let their foundations be established as the heavens. As for me, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, save me from sin against your great divinity, and give me life until distant days. And as for Belshazzar, my firstborn son, my own child, let the fear of your great divinity be in his heart, and may he commit no sin. May he enjoy happiness in life. So you can see there's a clear reference to Belshazzar in this particular uh, uh, cylinder, and he is Nebuchadnezzar' firstborn son. So we know who he is historically. The British Museum also has an, an administrative document dated the 24th day of Kislimu in the 11th year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And it mentions a slave of Belshazzar, or Belshazzar, son of the king. So although Belshazzar was acting as regent, as king at this time, the formal date... Uh, shows that this was the 11th year of Nabonidus. So he was still the reigning monarch. That uh, administrative document, by the way, dates to 545 BC. Belshazzar was Nabonidus' son. He was left in charge of the kingdom while his father was gone for 10 years in Arabia. And I think some of this makes more sense as we get down to the text. I'll mention that in just a second. But they jo jointly ruled the kingdom of Babylon. And we find out about this joint rule uh, with the Babylonian Chronicles, which were discovered near the Ishtar Gate in Babylon. What's nice is these documents were written on stone, so they were well preserved. And so we're able to find them and of course, we're, we are able to decipher the, the cuneiform writing. The Net Bible Study Notes tells us that, as is clear from the extra-biblical records, it was actually Nebuchadnezzar uh, who was king of Babylon at this time. However, Nebuchadnezzar spent long periods of time at Tima, and during these times, Belshazzar, his son, was de facto king of Babylon. This arrangement may help to explain why later in this chapter, Belshazzar promises that the, sex, the successful interpreter of the handwriting on the wall will be made third ruler in the kingdom. If Belshazzar was, an infected, was in effect second ruler in the kingdom, this would be the highest honor he could grant. So that explains to us who Belshazzar is historically. Belshazzar gave a banquet uh, 
for a thousand of his nobles as Daniel chapter 5 opens. Uh, this number probably included wives and concubines as well. That was a very typical of a Babylonian feast because they included wives and concubines. We get to the, the Medo-Persians, and that's reflected in Esther chapter 1. We find that the women were, had their own banquet separately. This banquet here that Belshazzar gave seems to have been quite heavy on drink. John Lennox commented that the story of Belshazzar's feast is one of the most famous parts of the book of Daniel. It has been notably painted by Rembrandt and set to music in the celebrated oratorio by William Walton. From it comes the memorable phrase, the writing is on the wall, and it forms a spectacular tragic climax to the first half of Daniel's work. The palace, we know from excavations in Babylon, included a plastered throne room. It would have been 52 meters by 17 meters, if you're like me and thinking old money, 170 feet by 56 feet. Now that probably would have been a bit cramped for a thousand guests, but it's entirely plausible that it could have been used. We know historically that Cyrus's army had already defeated the Babylonian armies. Babylon was surrounded, and what's Belshazzar doing? Belshazzar's giving a huge feast. Warren Wearsby commented on this. Belshazzar knew that the army of the Medes and Persians was camped, encamped outside the city, but he was indifferent to the danger that they posed. After all, the city was surrounded by a complex series of walls, some of them over 300 feet high, and there were numerous defense towers on the walls. Could any army break through the fortified bronze gates? Wasn't there sufficient water for the people from the Euphrates River that flowed through the city from north to south? And wasn't there adequate food stored in the city? If ever a man was proud of his achievements and had basked in self-confidence, it was Belshazzar. So that's what we see happening. And there he is in this banquet and he's drinking wine in front of everyone. If you think about a head table, and it's very well, very likely was an elevated head table so everybody could see him as the king. Homer Haley adds that from the emphasis given to wine in the chapter, it seems that the feast was more a drinking hour or wine fest than a food festival, although food was probably served. And even our pubs today, even though it's the people go there to drink, they do serve food. And that's sort of the idea that lots of drink, you need some food as well. So that may be the idea going on here as well. Being inebriated, Belshazzar ordered the gold and silver vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the Lord's Temple in Jerusalem to be brought out so that they could all drink from them. Uh, before we get into what's going on with the drinking here, notice that Nebuchadnezzar is referred to as Belshazzar's father. And I would place that in quotes if I was doing it. Uh, we know that he was not the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, this is not a direct father-son relationship. Uh, he was, though, as we mentioned, possibly a descendant of the great king, although not through his father, it'd be through his mother. Inscriptions tend to indicate that ne Nebuchadnezzar, his, uh, Belshazzar's dad, married Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, and that is a distinct possibility. But he was a ruler after Nebuchadnezzar, and in that sense, he would also have been a son. The Net Bible Study Notes tells us that um, this word translated father could be uh, equally translated ancestor or predecessor. Um, we see that in verse 11, verse 13, verse 18 as well. The Aramaic word translated father can on occasion denote these other relationships. 
Concerning the difficulty in tracing the lineage of Belshazzar, whose actual father was Nebuchadnezzar, back to Nebuchadnezzar, John Goldinger, in the word biblical commentary on Daniel, argues that the two chief points in Neo-Babylonian history are the empire's rise under Nebuchadnezzar and its fall under Nebuchadnezzar Belshazzar. So that Nebuchadnezzar, the father of Belshazzar, summarizes and reflects the general historical facts of the period. So all that does make sense in the historical context. The vessels were brought out, the ones from God's temple in Jerusalem that Nebuchadnezzar had taken. They're filled with wine, and the people drink toasts to their idols from the goblets which have been consecrated to be used in the worship of God. And again, the Net Bible Study Notes comments that making use of sacred temple vessels for an occasion of reveling and drunkenness such as this would have been a religious affront of shocking proportions to the Jewish captives, if they had known, of course, what was going on. While all this was going on, suddenly there appeared the fingers of a hand in midair, which began to write on the plaster of the wall. Uh, that it was opposite the lampstand indicates that this was in clear view of at least Belshazzar, if not everyone there. The king saw this hand, and he immediately turned pale. The strength went out of his legs, and his knees began to knock together. I think we could easily say he was extremely frightened. Uh, the alcohol may have contributed to some of this. In fact, how would we react if we were sitting watching television one night um, or eating or whatever we do and suddenly a hand showed up on our wall and started writing at it, on it? I think we'd be terrified as well. Uh, John Lennox wrote that the God that Belshazzar didn't believe existed had broken through all his feeble defenses and finally gained the king's undivided attention. It must have been terrifying for him to discover in this way that the God he did not believe in was the God who was there. Absolutely. Immediately. He called for the wise men of the land to read and interpret the words which had been written on the wall by the disembodied hand. The words were difficult to read, let alone understand. Now, it could be that they were written as unpointed consonants. Uh, being able to read unpointed text is partly dependent on first understanding it, from what I understand, because I don't read any of that. John Lennox points out that in the English alphabet, there are two kinds of letters, consonants and vowels. The writing on the wall was in a language whose written form only involved consonants. The vowels had to be supplied by the reader. And it's assumed that it's, it was either Hebrew or Aramaic, which are vowel or consonant-only languages. And I think we could realize how difficult it would be to read something without any vowels, even in English. Uh, it would be a bit difficult. Warren Wearsby explained it this way. He said, both Hebrew and Aramaic are read from right to left. And the vowels must be supplied by the reader. But we aren't told whether the four words were written in a line like this or in a square to be read from top down, like this. We just don't know. By the way, in uh, this quote, uh, words we also points out that these apostrophes that we have in the square there represent the, he the, the letter Aleph, which is the soundless first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, the U, by the way, because your translation may have the, 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 the last word is uh, farsen, uh, the U, but you may have U-Farsen, and that U represents the letter for and. Uh, 
and because that's all they used was a letter. So um, that, that could be the difference there. But that's that's the problem. I think you can see how difficult it would be if you just saw so you just saw these letters show up on your wall to figure out what exactly it meant. Well, the king does what the king normally does. He called for his wise men and astrologers and wanted them to read it and interpret it. And if they could do that, they would be well rewarded. He specifically mentions the rewards they're going to have. They would be robed in purple. That was a color usually reserved for royalty to wear. So they're going to be recognized as royalty. They would have a gold chain. Your translation may say a gold collar hung around their necks. And they would be promoted uh, to the third person in the kingdom. And as we mentioned earlier, the first person would have been Nebonidas. The second, of course, being Belshazzar himself. And the third would be this person. And although this was the highest he could offer, when you think about it, uh, Babylon was about to fall. We know that. We've seen the rest of the story. That was a pretty worthless uh, reward, wasn't it? Because being third in the kingdom might mean you, you would be the third to die. You never know. Pretty worthless there. So that, th th that, may be, that seems to be what's going on here. The wise men came, but no one could read the writing, nor could they tell the king what it meant. Um, this realization inspired even more fear in Belshazzar, and that the color drained from his face further, and his nobles were thrown into a state of confusion. And that's when the queen or the queen mother enters the banqueting hall. I get the feeling that, she, well, she wasn't there, and she probably heard the noise. Can, can you imagine the noise? Um, probably when the hand was initially seen, it would have been total silence. But the fact that nobody could read it, nobody could understand it, the king is terrified, I get the feeling everybody started talking at once. And so quite a noise, and she comes in. Mentioned this is probably the Queen Mother, if you notice the text there in the Net Bible, that they use the Queen Mother there. Uh, this is most likely the Queen Mother, uh, Belshazzar's mother, um, possibly the daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. The Net Bible study notes explain why they used it in this way. In Aramaic, the term is the Queen, and many translations go that way. In the following discourse, this woman is able to recall things about Daniel that go back to the days of Nebuchadnezzar, things that Belshazzar does not seem to recollect. It is likely that she was the wife, not of Belshazzar, but of Nebuchadnezzar, or perhaps even Nebuchadnezzar. In that case, queen here means queen mother. And the New Century Version actually uses the king's mother to identify her. Now, some scholars... Uh, David Recton in the Truth For Today commentary series, as our driver in the old Cambridge Bible for schools and colleges, suggested that she may have been Nebuchadnezzar's widow, and therefore Belshazzar's grandmother. But uh, historical rec records state that she would have died years before this, that her death would have been roughly in 547 B.C., we're in 539. So most likely this is Belshazzar's mother, or as we would call her today, the Queen Mother. She begins to speak to Belshazzar. She asked him, why was he, why was he so despondent? Didn't he know his own history? They had a man in the kingdom who could help him out of this predicament, who had the spirit of the gods in him. During the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he was known to possess clear insight and godlike wisdom, so much so that Nebuchadnezzar made him the chief of the wise men. The man's name was Daniel. The king called him, that's Nebuchadnezzar called him, Belteshazzar. He was known to have exceptional ability. Uh, with knowledge, insight, uh, 
and the gift of interpreting dreams, explaining riddles, and unraveling problems. The Aramaic literally there of solve difficult problems literally is to loosen knots. I uh, sort of like that uh, idea of uh, loosening difficult problems, loosening knots. But basically what she's telling Belshazzar is that this is the ideal man for the king to call to find out about the writing on the wall. Belshazzar should send immediately for Daniel. He would give the king the necessary interpretation. Now we might ask why Daniel was not called earlier. I think there's several reasons, but it very well could simply be he was a Jew. He was known to be a Jew, and Belshazzar is committing sacrilege against the Jewish God. At least that's how he thought of Yahweh. So uh, that may be why he totally um, didn't call on him. There's another reason as well, which we'll get to in a second. But uh, Daniel's brought in to see the king. And we need to keep in mind, he would have been an old man by now. The year is 539 B.C. It would, it would seem that Daniel was taken captive in that first deportation, 606-605 B.C., uh, 606, I believe. And if he was 15 then, add 67 years to that. And you get that he was now well over 80 years old. Um, I get the impression that uh, Belshazzar didn't know him because he doesn't seem to have any recollection of this man. Um, he's probably by now what we would refer to as retired. Having said that, we know if you remember from chapter 8, verse 27 in particular, that he was serving Belshazzar in the early years of his reign. He was going about doing the king's business. But having said that, that doesn't mean that Belshazzar actually knew who he was. I mean, unless you're an exceptional ruler, do you, do you know all those who are serving under you? Daniel's brought in. And Belshazzar explained his predicament. Uh, the wise men and the astrologers had been brought in to read and interpret the writing on the wall, but had been unable to do it. So, uh, it, it was said that Daniel was a man of clear insight who could furnish interpretations and unravel problems. Can he tell us? And if he does it, he would get those wonderful, wonderful uh, rewards. Uh, the wise men, Homer Haley points out, should not be censored for their failure in interpreting it. For their writing was from God. And only one given divine power could read and interpret the message. If they should be censored at all, it was for their working of the delusion that they had such power. And that's a good statement, isn't it? Uh, Daniel could just read and, and interpret this. He'd be given all those great gifts that had been offered. I love Daniel's response to this. He says, keep your gifts. I'm not interested in them. Give them to somebody else. But I will read the writing for the king. I will let you know what it meant. But before he does that, he gives Belshazzar a little lesson from history. It was God, Yahweh, who had given a kingdom with power, glory, and majesty to his forefather, Nebuchadnezzar. Because of all this power, all peoples and nations of every language had trembled before Nebuchadnezzar with fear. Nebuchadnezzar put to death whomever he wanted. He spared whom he wanted to spare. He promoted at will. He put down at will. But he became proud and arrogant. And when that happened... God stripped him of his royal throne, his glory, banished him from human society, and he, Nebuchadnezzar became like an animal. Uh, 
living with the wild asses and feeding on vegetation like an oxen. And he remained in this condition until he came to acknowledge that God was sovereign over all humanity and the one who was in control. The Net Bible Study Notes tells us that the point of describing Nebuchadnezzar as arrogant is that he had usurped divine prerogatives. And because of his immense arrogance, God had dealt decisively with him. And of course, you can see the application that Daniel's pointing towards concerning Belshazzar, can't you? See, although Belshazzar was aware of all of this, he had not humbled his heart. He had not learned the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar had had to learn. John Lennox writes, Belshazzar knew of Nebuchadnezzar's supernatural experiences with the God who stood behind those vessels. He knew that Nebuchadnezzar had eventually come to worship and honor this God as the God of heaven. He knew all this, and yet he rejected it, rejected it so vehemently that he made up his mind to publicly repudiate God in a gesture of deliberate blasphemy. As Daniel put it, Belshazzar had exalted himself against the God of heaven. He did this by taking the temple vessels dedicated to the worship of God and drinking toasts to false gods from them. Uh, gods that could not see or hear or comprehend, who were only objects of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. He had not given glory to God, the same God who was the one who supplied his every breath, the one who was really in control. That's why God sent the hand and why it wrote the inscription on the wall. Um, John Goldinge wrote in the Word Biblical Commentary series, Historically, Belshazzar perhaps fell because he could not handle a political crisis. But more profoundly, as Daniel sees it, he fell because of his irresponsibility before God. And he references uh, this chap that he got this information from, this idea from. The inscribed words were these. Many, many, tekel, eupharsin, or and farsin. Uh, that word, uh, the you or the and there, possibly was not part of what was written on the wall. It could have just been the four words. In fact, I get the impression it was the four words, but as Daniel would have recited it, he would have put in the and for it to make sense. Now, if you notice the word there, farsin, is different than the word later on down when he interprets it, which is pires, two lines there below farsin. Uh, the difference is that farsin is a uh, plural word. Uh, Pires is a singular word. So he then proceeds to give the interpretation. Many uh, literally means to, uh, means to number. It's an Aramaic term referring to a measure of weight. And what that meant was that God had numbered the days of Belshazzar's kingdom and brought it to an end. It's used twice here, many, many, and probably for emphasis. It's ending. Tekel means to weigh. Uh, he had been weighed in the balance and he had been found wanting. Belshazzar isn't looking too good, is he? Pires, um, which is a singular word, as I mentioned, means torn or divided. And Belshazzar's kingdom had been divided and given to the Medes and to the Persians. Some commentators emphasize that Perez is very similar to the word Persian, and that may be an indicate a sort of double meaning in that as well, and that could be possible. But think about that. Even if Belshazzar could have read the actual words, he would have struggled to figure out what this meant in relation to him. Although if he'd read numbered, weighed, and divided, 
I'm sure that may have put some terror into him, although he might not have known the details of what happened. Warren Wiersbe points out that there are times when God gives warnings in order to bring sinners to repentance, such as when he sent Jonah to Nineveh. But there are also times when his warnings are final and divine judgment is determined. When God warned Nebuchadnezzar about his pride and unconcern for the poor, he gave the king a year in which to repent and seek God's forgiveness. The king refused to humble himself, and judgment fell. But when Daniel confronted Belshazzar, he offered him no way of escape. This is judgment rather than warning. At Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain hung around his neck, and a proclamation was made that he should rank third in the kingdom. And that very night... Belshazzar was killed. Sir Edwin Arnold wrote a poem, um, which is quite lengthy. Uh, F.W. Ferrer, in his commentary on the book of Daniel in the Expositor's Bible series, quotes the uh, four of the lines. I think thought they summed up very well what happened. That night they slew him on his father's throne. He died unnoticed, and the hand unknown Crownless and scepterless, Belshazzar lay, a robe of purple round a form of clay. That's exactly what happened. This, by the way, is quite an extensive poem. One of the commentaries I have uh, has the whole thing printed. So it's, it's quite a long poem. Um, Farrer goes ahead to point out, and I thought this was, was of significance, that... Um, Belshazzar, his name meant literally Bel preserve the king, Bel being one of the, the idol gods. But he, uh, Pharaoh comments, but Bel bowed down, and Nebo, and another one of the false gods, Nebo stooped and gave no help to their votary. Uh, you may be like me, and votary is not a word in our English usage. I looked it up in the dictionary. It means a devoted follower, adherent, or advocate of someone or something else. So the false gods gave him no help, gave Belshazzar no help. They were nothing, as Daniel had put it. They could not do anything anyway. According to historians, by the way, this took place on the 12th of October in the year 539 B.C. That Bible study notes the year was 539 B.C. At this time, Daniel would have been approximately 81 years old. The relevant extra-biblical records describing the fall of Babylon include portions of Herodotus, Xenophon, Barossus, cited in Josephus, the Cyrus Cylinder, and the Babylonian Chronicle. So all that we have historical documents that talk about the fall of Babylon. The text tells us that Darius the Mede took the kingdom, 62 years old. Uh, he didn't as much conquer Babylon as receive it. We know that to conquer Babylon, what they did was diverted the flow of the Euphrates River, which ran through Babylon, ran under Babylon, and the army entered the city on the dry riverbed. Very clever, if you think about it. Uh, John Lennox says it would appear from extra-biblical evidence that Babylon fell to Persian troops without a battle in Nebuchadnezzar's absence. Herodotus records in his histories how the Persian troops gained access to the city by temporarily diverting the flow of the river U Euphrates. Darius the Mede. Uh, we have no extra-biblical record of this person. Uh, nothing outside the Bible. Uh, so we don't totally know anything about him except for what we find here in the book of Daniel. Now there are some suggestions the scholars make. Some suggest this may have been another name for Cyrus because kings often had more than one name. Um, there's no real evidence for that in extra biblical records and historical records, so we can't really uh, attach... Uh, all that much to that. We know that there are 
other kings named Darius. Maybe that would lend to this uh, idea. But uh, the ones we know historically are from a later era. Uh, some take the view, Homer Haley amongst others, that this is somebody we know from inscriptions as Gabaru. John Whitcomb uh, Jr. wrote a book entitled Darius the Mede, which advocates this position, and it very well could be correct. Uh, Warren Wiersbe commented that many students believe that Darius was Gaburu, Guburo, an important officer in the army whom Cyrus made ruler of the province of Babylon. So that would seem to fit, wouldn't it? Would it not? Darius the Mede must not be confused with Darius the First who ruled from 522 to 486. And you can see 522 is quite a few years after 539. Darius I encouraged the Jewish remnant in the restoration of the temple. That's recorded in Ezra 5 and 6. He went on in a footnote to say some scholars think that Darius was the title of the Persian ruler, just as Pharaoh was the title of the Egyptian ruler. This would mean that Darius Mead could have been Cyrus himself. So all of that is a good explanation as to who this could have been. Uh, so very well could be correct. Uh, but so Darius Mead, either it's another name for Cyrus or it is somebody he put in charge of ruling uh, over Babylon. So either is possible. The Medes and Persians were one kingdom. Although initially, as you can see from this map, they would have been two. If you notice, Media was quite extensive. Babylon is still active there. Persia down in the bottom there. Uh, the Medes were from an area which includes modern-day Azerbaijan and northern Iran. They formed an alliance with Babylon and others to destroy Assyria in 605 BC. But that alliance ended during Nebuchadnezzar's reign. They began to conquer Babylon in 555 BC. Cyrus became king over the Medes in 549. You can see on the map there, he plundered the Median capital in 550. Um, although he, Cyrus was of Persian descent, he didn't begin to rule over Persia until 546 BC. Persia, as you can see, is in the southern part of present-day Iran. They became one kingdom, as is shown here in the green, and really the world empire at this particular time. The kingdom is known in the text here in Daniel as the Medes and Persians. If you remember from Esther, it's referred to as Persia and Media. And they, uh, apparently historical documents can go either directions. Medes and Persians, Persia and Media. Um, I usually refer to it as the Medo-Persian Empire. Of the two groupings there, the Medes were considered the more advanced, the more civilized of the two. Greek ref writers referred to the whole as Medes long after Cyrus' days. You'll find Cyrus referred to as both Cyrus the Mede and Cyrus the Persian. It's one and the same person. But what we find here is that Babylon had fallen and it was no more. It's now the Medo-Persian Empire. Warren Wearsby wrote, the city of Babylon boasted that it was impregnable, that there was enough food stored away to feed the population for 20 years. But the Lord said that Babylon's time had come. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples to no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. That's a quote of Psalm 33. The will of God shall be done, Wearsby says, no matter what. And that's what happened. A point of textual interest here. If you're following along in some translations, uh, some versions of, uh, of Daniel, you will f uh, find that in the last verse, there's a, sl a slightly different type of uh, numbering. The Net Bible does this. Um, in Aramaic, what we have in our English versions is chapter 531. is actually chapter 6, verse 1. 
uh, the beginning of the next chapter. And uh, the ver verse numbers between English and Aramaic are one different then throughout chapter 6 until we get to chapter 7. That's just a point of interest. I don't know why. Uh, it's, it's divided up differently, but that's what we know from text. That might be of interest to you. But what are the lessons that we can learn from this chapter of Daniel? Uh, obviously, God is in control. It has to be a lesson. It's a lesson we find in every chapter in the book of Daniel. He is supreme. He is sovereign. Not just, by the way, of those who believe in him, but those who don't believe in him. And we'll make a little comment on that a little bit later on as well. We do find that God is, is in control also of world powers. He's the one that makes nations rise and fall. He brought Babylon to the front. He made Babylon fall. He brought the you know, Persian Empire to the front. God is in total control. And we find that God will judge the world. Um, we, that's a lesson I think we can learn here. Um, Pharaoh suggested that this was the lesson from chapter 5. Always be ready for God's final judgment. You see, Belshazzar wasn't. He wasn't ready for God's judgment and was found wanting. We need to always be ready. I think that's a lesson we can take away from this chapter. A fourth lesson would be that God humbles the proud. And maybe we could add to that, especially those who do not believe in him. Many today seem to think that if they don't believe in God, that he ceases to exist, that he is nothing. That's what Belshazzar thought, wasn't it? And then, of course, God sent the hand to write on the wall, proving to Belshazzar that he really was there. John Lennox wrote, Belshazzar's blasphemous drinking to the idols of the Babylonian pantheon stands in stark contrast to the privilege that Christians have in expressing their loyalty and worship to God as their king through a different ceremonial act of drinking. They are called upon by no less than the Lord Jesus himself to meet regularly with other believers to celebrate the new covenant that binds them to him eternally. Yes, we drink to Jesus as well when we partake of the Lord's Supper each Lord's Day, remembering through the grape juice his shed blood. A fifth lesson, and this one I thought was interesting. I've read this in, uh, in uh, Warren Wearsby's commentary. We need to respect those who are in authority over us. And we see this in Daniel's response to Belshazzar. He responds respectfully. Wearsby wrote this. Daniel was respectful to the king, but he was not afraid to tell him the truth. Even if we don't respect the officer in the way he or she lives, we must respect the office for the powers that be are ordained of God. You know, it's easy to forget this when there are those in government who live and act in ways that do not engender respect. As Christians, even if we don't agree with our rulers, we still acknowledge them, we still respect them, we still pray for them, and all that's found in the writings of the apostles. That's what we're to do for Christians. And one last lesson. We don't know what influence we're going to have on those around us. This was a, a lesson that Homer Haley spoke about. He wrote this, Consider the growth and development of Nebuchadnezzar's faith and comprehension of God's greatness through the faithfulness of Daniel and his three friends. And of the queen mother, who remembered Daniel's power through his God and recommended calling for him in time of need. One can never realize fully the leavening influence faithful lives can have on the world. Daniel really made quite an impact on Nebuchadnezzar's court, didn't he? Even so much that years later, in fact, almost 60 years later, 
the queen mother remembers Daniel and what Daniel had done for who we believe was her father, King Nebuchadnezzar. She remembered that. Daniel had quite an influence. Thank you for joining us for this particular study. Uh, in our next lesson, we will be jumping ahead to Daniel chapter 9, uh, chapters 9 and 10. Two more vision chapters take place in this, uh, if I remember correctly, this first year of Darius the Mede. And so we're going to add those in here. Uh, and then we'll do chapter 6, and then we'll conclude our study with chapters 11 and 12. Thank you for joining us, and we hope that this has been of benefit to you.